Please welcome your panelists for Blockchain, It's Not Just About the Money, moderated by Executive Director of the Milken Institute's Center for Financial Markets, Stacey Warden. Guys, it's five o'clock. I mean, this is quite a testament to uh, audience interest in the blockchain. Happy hour is only an hour away. This is a pretty good crowd. So let's, just before I start, can I just get a little bit of an audience poll? Who in the audience has ever invested in Bitcoin or any kind of a cryptocurrency? Okay, not bad. Who knows what the blockchain is, kind of more or less? Okay. My, none, of my, none of my panel hands went up. Did, any, did that make anybody nervous? <laughs> All right. Okay, can we get a little... Um, uh, Transformational versus total hype. Transformational? Total hype? Not really sure, and I'm going to learn on this panel. OK, all right, great. So um, before we start, um, I wanted to remind you all that the Milken Institute is a, a nonprofit organization. And we are, are of course, indebted to our sponsors and our, and our patrons for for financing the work that uh, we do, and, but frankly, it's, uh, it's not enough. Uh, and so, as of now, uh, the Milken Institute is going to be issuing its own coin. <laughs> <laughs> We're calling it Milk Coin. <laughs> you can earn Milk Coin by asking good questions, you know, being nice to my panelists, and by, uh, okay, so, enough. <laughs> Uh, I am so honored to, this is a basically CEO level uh, panel up here. We've got, uh, starting in no particular order, uh, Charles Neuer, uh, uh, who is quantitative re researcher and also sort of head of investments for Pantera Capital. On the uh, far end, Patrick Moynihan, who's CEO of Blockchain Industries. Uh, right next to me, Eric Miller, founder and CEO of Coin Circle. Uh, on this side of me, Pete, uh, are you next to me? Pete Martin, founder and CEO of Votem, and Ashish Gadness, uh, Gadness, founder and CEO of BangQ. All kind of blockchain play. We've got investors, we've got application builders, we've got service providers, so we're really gonna try to get, uh, get a full picture of what this technology is about, what its capabilities can be, and um, how, to, how to navigate its potential. But to start, what I thought I would just do is kind of just go right down the line and ask you guys to just give you know, two or three minutes about what your companies do so that the audience has a sense of where you're all com coming from. So I'll just kind of go right down the line to start, starting with you, yeah. Uh, Patrick Moynihan, CEO of Blockchain Industries. We have three primary lines of business, investment management, ICO consulting and media and conferences in the middle. Um, our specialty is we have large distribution in Japan. Our partners have placed over $2 billion over the last two and a half years in the Asian markets. And so we cover the broad ecosystem. All right. uh, Charlie Noyes, uh, I'm an investor with Pantera Capital, one of the largest uh, funds in the space focused on uh, blockchain, cryptocurrency, digital assets, everything from straight normal equity venture to uh, pre-ICO token sales, uh, actively managed hedge funds, um, yeah, and basically uh, run investments there. I'm Eric Miller, from the CEO of CoinCircle, and um, what we do is we provide an end-to-end -end platform and solution services for the tokenization of existing companies um, and enterprises. And we do everything from, uh, you know, help build the technology. Um, we have a full stack of, uh, of software and uh, technology platform that can facilitate the tokenization um, of, a, of a company or their product. And I'm Pete Martin. I'm the founder and CEO of Votum. And we do voting on blockchain for both public and private elections. So professional associations like the Ohio State Bar Association that is voting on their president this week to actually running public elections, which we're doing for some of the midterms. Hi, I'm Ashish. I'm one of the co-founders of uh, BankU. We're a for-profit, uh, for-purpose uh, software as a service company built completely on blockchain, primarily focused on last mile uh, traceability and transparency in a way that brings uh, gender equality in extreme poverty zones uh, and for refugees and migrant workers, the ability to get their lives back. Okay, so we've got four, four for-profit and one non-profit. Um, 
So just to kind of gauge for the audience the panel credibility, are the for-profits making money? Yeah? Yeah. Yes. Yeah? Yes. All right. Yes. Okay, good. So you can stay. They'll listen, they'll listen to you now. <laughs> so let me, uh, let me just start with maybe the investors and ask, what is it about this space? And you're not kind of just chasing tulip bubbles, obviously, right? I mean, it's, it's inherently a, a, a speculative, but if you think about not a, you know, a, a world, it's, it's not as interesting to me to talk about kind of Bitcoin going to 19,000 and coming that back and how you can make money on that. What's really interesting to me is this technology of blockchain and how uh, transformative it, it can be. So as investors, when you think about that, what do you think, what excites you and what do you think the potential is for? And I'll ask all three of you <coughs> kind of in, it, in no particular order. Uh, I, I think that, you know, to understand blockchain and cryptocurrency, I, I think the first thing that people need to realize is it's a social movement. Um, yes, there's a lot of money chasing everything, but I think deep down and underneath there's a, there's a deep, powerful social movement. And, you know, in terms of the consensus algorithm, whether it's proof of work or proof of stake or proof of time and space, I like to say that the proof of value um, occurs in the actual token cycle itself. So the market participants are actually adding value to that network and growing it by adding that value back in. And that's something that's a completely new paradigm in terms of capital formation and where the value accrues in a new model. Um, to me, that's a really powerful social movement. And as people get more engaged with these different systems, these systems can grow and effectively just grow themselves to be bigger and bigger based on that value that the participants offer into that network. You know, and not just a social movement, almost even really an economic revolution, um, and, uh, and a really powerful one, potentially. And I, I think if you look at, uh, you know, all the assets and all the different asset classes that exist today, um, you know, there's the potential to tokenize and, and you know, really uh, represent a huge amount of assets that don't currently have, you know, that aren't currently traded uh, in the financial markets. Okay, um, explain tokenize. So, so what tokenization is, is um, so at its, at its root, it's really like taking data mm -hmm. or taking something and splitting it up into, uh, you know, cryptographic chunks. Um, but, you know, when in, what I'm referring to is the tokenization in the issuance of a cryptocurrency that can represent that underlying asset. It's quite simple. I mean, it's very similar to how equities uh, work. And, you know, if you look back at when equities were, you know, a new innovation, um, you know, it was, a, it was a pretty revolutionary idea to split your company up into shares and then sell them to people in order to acquire financing. And so tokenization is a very similar, uh, you know, has very similar mechanics. Um, and you could think of a real estate investment trust, for example, um, that's really like a tokenized uh, s building or, you know, s series of buildings or real estate investments. So um, essentially, uh, you know, you can represent uh, partial ownership or rights into uh, an asset uh, through token by tokenizing it. Um, and you can even do things because it's on the blockchain and it's all done programmatically uh, where, you know, s dividends are issued automatically or um, even cooler things, uh, you know, that... Uh, that aren't really possible with traditional financing vehicles. And so uh, it's a pretty exciting area. Okay, but Charles so, Neuer, I mean, honestly, this is a, a Google Doc, right? Is this, this is just a distributed database. So like, what is the big deal? Am I wrong about that? Like, what is the big deal? Okay, so uh, I actually disagree with, with uh, mo m most of that, which is that... Uh, oh, good. Okay, this should be interesting. <laughs> what I'm talking about <laughs> late night, you know. My general pitch on cryptocurrency is that this is an attempt to run an experiment on large-scale social coordination um, in a way that we haven't seen before. Um, Bitcoin is essentially an experiment in immutability through code. Whether or not that, that as an idea, has better properties than other things that we, you would consider to be immutable or comparable. So the reason why people say that Bitcoin is like digital gold uh, is because that's essentially how it was designed, but a question of whether or not this would be better than physical gold. Um, so. I don't think that anyone really knows where this is going to go. Um, the things that I like to invest in and the way that I think about this space is that it gives us an opportunity as programmers, economists, game theorists, etc., to try and design systems to coordinate large numbers of people and large amounts of value in ways that would normally not be possible, um, just functionally impossible. Um, many different aspects of blockchain technology play into this, consensus mechanisms, uh, open participation, immutability, uh, the fact that you can't really block access to it. Um, it's, it's kind of like saying, um, 
it's kind of like saying, how can I design systems in such a way that the optimal way for people to act in them is one that is uh, ultimately value creating? Um, how can I design interesting systems to get people to do what I want, really, is, is what it comes down to. Um, and I think the reason why we sort of look at this from a finance perspective to begin with is that that's the best analog that we have today out in the world. Um, ultimately, markets are systems of social coordination. Um, and, and our question here is, is, can we essentially try and design markets around everything? Um, and I think the first things that people are starting to understand and that do make some sense to me and that I do believe is that at a minimum out of this, we'll design better markets in some ways. Um, I think the only projects out there that I believe will be successful as of right now are those that do that in a very pure way that kind of lends itself to this idea of like, <coughs> we're just doing this in finance. But in the very long run, to the point about um, capital formation, how people raise money, how this is gonna work, um, people are already starting to put forward proposals for things uh, like DICOs. What this is, is instead of an ICO where, you know, you like make a website and raise a couple hundred million dollars and, and I don't know, um, you essentially create a smart contract with everyone who invests in it that allows them to uh, essentially faucet out the money over time based on progress, participation, uh, relative ownership being a function of how involved they are in the governance of these systems. Um, and so my general thesis and pitch on why this is not Google Docs is that Google Docs is a way of coordinating people on some document. This is a way of forcing people to act correctly through incentives. Um, and that's like a really powerful idea when you think, around, when you think about in the very long run, um, you know, what, what has ended up working. Okay, markets uh, have worked. All right, so before we turn to applications, you know, Patrick or Eric, you know, it just seems to me this is just a way maybe to be getting around regulation, to getting around the, the, the central bank money supply of a country, to getting around the uh, SEC and the, and the IPO process. I mean, you know, if you uh, talk to sort of the woman on the street about this, it's like, what? They started a new coin on the basis of a white paper, and there are what, like 900 currencies out there right now? And, you know, what is this? It, you know, it was $400, now it's $19,000. Like, it's the Wild West. It's a, it, there's tulips everywhere here. Is that fair? I mean, I, I don't think, uh, I, I think that that could be one way to look at it. And there, it's true that markets are highly speculative, and there's a lot of exuberance and irrationality. Um, but, you know, I do think that uh, the, the overall decentralization and disintermediation and, like, sort of self-governance that uh, blockchains enable is, uh, is, is a really powerful aspect. And, and really, I don't think any of it has to do with uh, circumventing uh, regulatory, uh, you know, like, rules and, no, and no. laws. I, I mean, I, well, potentially some bad actors, right? But there's bad actors in, in almost every space. Um, you know, I mean, at least uh, the technologies that we build are fully compliant, right? So, um, and, and it's cool because they're integrated with the blockchain. So, an example of that. Talk about that, yeah. Yeah, an example of that is, um, you know, uh, know your customer and anti-money laundering, um, as well as, uh, say, investor accreditation processes. Um, you know, those can go, th those processes can take place, and you can know, you can have the identity of the user, of the, uh, of the investor or the participant um, connected directly to a digital wallet, and that wallet uh, can be issued on the blockchain, that wallet address, so it's now a trusted, known wallet um, address that can, can participate in the ecosystem in a credible and responsible way. Um, and I think, you know, that while obviously overregulation of any space can lead to um, sort of a, uh, you know, friction in terms of economic growth, um, you know, I also think that uh, the, the complete lack of regulation can lead to, uh, you know, you know, uh, really bad things that you don't want to see happen, like money laundering and, um, you know, other types of activities. Uh, so I, I think it's important to be responsible in regards to those uh, those areas and uh, and really think rationally about uh, about responsible policies as well. Okay, Patrick, anything to add? Or yeah, I mean, I would just say that you know all those regulations that are put in place, they're burdensome, they're costly, they're expensive. Those can simply go away based on an incentivization model that works and makes people act in appropriate and proper ways. Talk about that. Well, I mean, I think the first thing that when, when I look at the space, 
you know, people say, is this going to last? Is this here forever? Well, I don't think anyone knows the answer to that question, but um, cryptocurrencies are here to stay in my mind because the world wants dollars, right? I mean, they just do, and they don't trust their own government's currencies from debasement. Um, so they're flocking to cryptocurrencies to basically protect their own uh, earnings and their own capital. Um, that, that's the first piece. And the, and the second piece is that, you know, people act in ways that benefit themselves. It's just human nature. So, you know, Charlie mentioned gamification. We have a bunch of gamification people on our, in our company that really create these incentivization models that get people to act appropriately. And therefore, you won't, you won't need the regulations and the expense and the burdens of having those. Now, we're, we're certainly not looking to replace governments. We're looking to work with them and collaborate with them. And you know, as a CEO of a publicly traded company, we are all about compliance and leading the conversation on compliance and AML and all those very important things. You know, we, we want to be patriots in the space for our government to make sure that this is here to stay and that this country can embrace it and grow it. Yeah, I think the general uh, opinion of the space is that uh, dumb regulations should be ignored and the rest should be here to stay. So what I mean by this is, like not literally, clearly, uh, there's a lot of regulation out there that I, I think sh exists, should always exist, et cetera. But as an example, um, one of the thing, one of my favorite projects in the space, Orchid, it's an attempt to create uh, a model like Tor, the onion router, which uh, was a NATO project that essentially allows you to access the internet uh, in an anonymous way, originally designed for dissidents. Um, and essentially, Orchid is an attempt to create an incentivized version of this. So faster, more accessible, not reliant on people's altruism to keep it maintained. Um, I think that a lot of people in the space have an issue with discussions like these because there's an overriding belief that code is speech, and that's kind of like the flag in the ground that we've planted in the space, that, um, that my ability to design systems and access them openly is tantamount, um, and that this is one of the first ways we've ever seen that um, you can do that and, and, and it's really up to you, right? Like, there is no functional way to shut Bitcoin down at this point. It is something immutable that will remain immutable feasibly until, uh, unless the internet was shut off, essentially. And actually, even then, it would still probably continue. Quantum. Yeah, and, <laughs> and actually, I think that's true. And I think what most people don't realize is, at least the way I see things, is that we're now entering into uh, a type of crypto economic arms race. Um, you know, where the, a new economy is emerging. Um, and uh, the, because of the decentralized uh, and completely distributed nature of blockchains, they can't really be stopped. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I, you know and that's like not... how is going to come over? Yeah, you know, actually, uh, you know, super intelligent, artificial intelligence on the blockchain is actually kind of a terrifying concept, but that's a different... Uh, probably, <laughs> probably a different conversation, but um, but but because they can't really be taken down or stopped, um, it, it poses a real challenge. Uh, from I would I would also make the point though that and I was going to end on. I think we've discovered about maybe 0.1 percent of what is going to eventually be possible with this kind of technology, and so tautologically we should be uh, you know superseding 0.1 percent of regulations, and I think over time. Uh, like at, at this point, I would not argue against nearly any existing regulation, at least one that we would all, for the most part, agree is rational. Um, I think it's more just an argument that in the long run, we're going to have to have hard conversations about what it means for uh, code to be speech, access to always be open in, in sort of a, in an uncensorable way. Um, but we are at the very, very early stages of that, and I, th I think it's just... Uh, something that a conversation that people can tell we're eventually going to have as a result of this technology, but not one that in any way right now necessitates us to say, you know, it's time to start throwing away, throwing away regulations. Right. So. You know, we designed this uh, panel so that as you look at the stage, all the money is on your right and all the, the do-gooders are on your left. So... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can do good with money. <laughs> no, <Nah>, I know. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we've talked, I think, in general terms about what the blockchain can do, and you two had, well, t tell, us, tell us your story a little bit, but as I imagine it, you, m maybe you had an idea for, I think you had a problem that you wanted to solve, and blockchain came along as the right solution. So why don't you kind of talk about what you, uh, 
how you decided to, to kind of change the world and affect the lives of a billion people. All right, so I'll, I'll make the story short, but I sold my business and was at a conference where um, the exercise was take out a blank piece of paper and write down what you'll do um, as your legacy, if you will, to positively impact a billion people in the world. So I look at this blank piece of paper for about five minutes and I write down mobile voting. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, wow, that's a brilliant idea. Why are we not doing that around the world? You have M-Pesa and other similar things around the world. Mobile clearly is the future globally. Um, and the more I looked at it, the more I said, why are we not doing that, right? And so that kind of started my journey. And so we started doing a lot of research, talking lots of secretaries of state and people that run elections. And we didn't pick a solution. We basically fundamentally knew that this was predominantly a security problem. So we ran a global innovation challenge in the summer of 2015. And we offered a quarter million dollars to anybody around the world that could come back with an architecture, if you will, a blueprint for an online voting system that couldn't be hacked. Well, there's a whole bunch of criteria, but that was the essence of it. And uh, we had 200 entries from people from 30 different countries, because clearly in the US, we're not leading in this regard. And a third of them were non-usable solutions, a third of them were using some old technology, and a third of them were blockchain. So uh, my advisory board and I started working through these submissions, and blockchain at the time, this is late 2015, seemed like a good idea, and still concerns about 51% control and scalability and some of the other things. And um, as we decided that that was the strategic direction we were gonna go, Microsoft announced they were gonna invest all kind of money in this space, IBM basically said the same thing. And what year are we in now? This was uh, late 2015. Um, and then that kind of started our building. And at the time, there really was, Ethereum was fairly new. There weren't really other blockchain frameworks that did not have all the cryptocurrency aspects to it. We had lots of debates around private versus public uh, blockchains and what was gonna be more pragmatically acceptable to elections officials, and that kind of started our journey. We can talk more about it a little bit. Okay, but what, tell us what is the product, you know, and how is the blockchain kind of part of the product? So, so literally you can vote online or on your phone, and every vote goes to these distributed nodes that are run and owned and powered by independent people who typically don't trust each other. And I'll give an example in just a second. That goes through a consensus algorithm we call proof of vote. And based on that, once there's consensus is reached, it's then written, that vote is written to the ballot box. Uh, we ran a vote for the Radio Hall of Fame last summer. And traditionally, they had done paper-based voting or through text, text messaging or whatever. And their accounting firm would come and certify the results. And it was typically two weeks after. And I mean, it's a somewhat inconsequential vote, right? You're just voting for your favorite radio personality. But these folks who supposedly won would have to wait two weeks for these results to be certified. Mm -hmm. So we took their accounting firm, we gave them an independent node and some other additional nodes on top of that, and they certified the results 20 minutes after the vote was over. Mm -hmm. They were incredibly happy. And so if you look at the political environment around elections, it's all about trust, right? And the fact of the matter is trust in elections globally is at an all-time low. In the 2016 U.S. election, two-thirds of all Americans don't actually believe the results. So if, imagine if you go to a sporting event, and I'm from Cleveland, so I'm going to bring up the Cavs from the last game, and you, you leave that? the game and what is, you... What's the cat? What is that? Is that Cavaliers. Like, uh -huh. and Cleveland Cavaliers. Yeah, yeah, Football yeah. or...? Yeah, that's a... Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. I'll get you for that, Stacey. Um, <laughs> And you leave the game and you're arguing about what the score is, right? It's, it's ridiculous. And that's what happens in the political arena with elections. And we talk about um, in the elections world, your job is to convince the loser that they lost because winners typically don't contest elections, right? So the trust and the verifiability and the transparency of what just happened, those are the big problems we're trying to solve. And then you add access on top of that and you get access out to everybody in a verifiable way. We, we talk to voters and we say, all right, you go fill out your paper ballot in a polling station and it feels secure, right? And it feels good because you just voted on a piece of paper. But do you really know if your vote was counted? Individually, right, right. then, you don't. Mm -hmm. 
right. right? We can solve that problem with blockchain. I think the vo lack of voter trust is, is two things. One is, you know, vote early, vote often, and, you know, double counting and not counting and all of that. But the other thing is this kind of hacking of the system. And is the blockchain more secure for that as well? Or? It is much more secure than the current <coughs> systems. Is, is it perfectly secure or is it just... No, we don't think anything. We, we never talk about something as unhackable. Mm -hmm. um, the difference with blockchain is because fundamentally it is math-based, if the math doesn't add up, if the, if the math of a transaction doesn't add up, that hash code, then it's not going to accept that transaction. And there are processes to treat it as a provisional ballot or um, ways to kind of work through that. Mm -hmm. That doesn't exist with the current system. Mm -hmm. Okay, so back to you three. Uh, just kidding, that's easy. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, so, so tell us about BankQ. Um, so um, I started BankQ because I got in a fight in Congo. Um, so I'll make it real. Um, so in, 19, um, in 1994, I moved to the U.S. from India. Um, I grew up poor like most Indians did in those days. And um, uh, the relevance is that when I came to the U.S. at $240, at the end, of, I came legally, if anybody's listening. Um, <laughs> 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 Call it ice. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks. Um, but, uh, but the interesting thing about that incident was that at the end of the month, you know, I had uh, $200 where Indians were cheap. But at a rent receipt, I had an em uh, employment letter at a pay stub. And I was very fortunate because that allowed me to open a bank account. Fast forward, uh, you know, I was able to build and sell, sell a couple of startups. And in 2012, I sold my last company, and I started volunteering in Congo. I'd spent a couple of years in and out of Congo. If you've ever been to the Congo, it's a pretty tough place to be. This is the DRC. And one of the mothers that I was working with, um, she had made a little bit of money on a harvest. You know, she was a farmer. And this is end of 2014. And uh, I had this big ego that I could solve Congo's problem. And I was completely wrong because she wanted to open a bank account. Uh, and I thought that was really smart. Right? Women are smarter than men, we know that. Yeah. And she wanted to open a bank account, but the local bank refused to bank her. And I got into a fight because uh, the guy kept saying, I can't bank her. She had three different United Nations identity cards. She had three different microfinance loans. Um, she had a harvest, um, yet she didn't exist. And the guy kept saying, I can't bank her. And after you know, a few hours of fighting with him. He said, I can't bank her, but I'll bank you. But for what reason was he giving that he could? Yeah, and what was interesting was that she, had, in a way, didn't exist, right? Because A, she was a woman. Um, B, she did not have the history of her existence. So she couldn't prove her transaction identity. She had identity. Like a lot of people talk about identity on blockchain. I think that's just uh, um, an easy way to kind of explain blockchain. The real hard part is people who live in extreme poverty exist in supply chains, but technically don't. Because in many ways, uh, you probably drank the cup of coffee from the tree that she harvested this morning, right? But she couldn't prove her transaction identity. She couldn't prove her harvest for the last five years. She couldn't prove that she existed in Congo. And if a war broke out and she had to move to Rwanda, her entire life would restart, right? So it was like people living in poverty or refugees or migrant workers are walking around with this big reset button on their head. And that's kind of when, when I realized that we had certified her poverty, but we hadn't pulled her out of poverty. And that's can, you know, at the same time, Ethereum had come up with this white paper. And so me and my whole team, we started looking at this idea of what if, what if we use blockchain without the cryptocurrency side? <laughs> and what if that mother would be able to build an economic passport that proved her identity beyond just an identity card? It would allow us to prove her harvest. It would allow her us to prove the transparency with which she was growing her crops, and that record would be immutable, that she would own it. And that's kind of how we started. Fast forward, uh, you know, we decided to build a for-profit software company, and we sell software to large corporations who are trying to get visibility and traceability and transparency in their supply chains, but in a way that that mother now can show her existence in that supply chain, in a way that that data is immutable, and in a way that she's never refused a bank account ever again because she can prove she exists. So that's what we do. How do you, though, I mean, I always, I always wonder about this, what the, the land title and Bitfury has sort of famously <coughs> done this land registration in Georgia, not the, the country, not the state. And I always wonder, you know, uh, uh, what is the kind of, gar how do you solve the garbage in, garbage out uh, problem with that? I think the way at least we've looked at it is, um, you know, you can't start a blockchain company and be the new intermediary, <laughs> um, and not to criticize anybody out there. But that's because that's the flaw in some of the models today is that 
Uh, people are trying to do good in the world using blockchain, but then now they own people's data, right? And that's kind of where the garbage in, garbage out. Whereas the way we looked at it is that that mother should have equal rights to participate in the transaction, which then prevents the garbage in, garbage out, right? So when I bring my bag of coffee or cacao, or if I'm making shoes for you know, a shoemaker, I get to participate in that transaction using blockchain because she says, yes, I accept the 40 kilos, yes, I accept the moisture content, and yes, I accept the price, right? Which then allows you to have both sides of the ledger agreeing, or disagreeing for that matter, and that's how you prevent it. Mm -hmm. um, I appreciate that we're in inning one of a kind of a, that's baseball, right? Is it? Yeah. Inning one, Cricket? No, yeah, inning one of a kind of nine inning game, I guess, on this. Uh, I remember when I first started getting interested in this in sort of 2013, 2014, uh, banks were really beginning to talk about, I guess that was more 14, 15, but banks really beginning to talk about the uh, billions of dollars that they were going to be able to save in, in back office uh, integration. So, you know, now it's every bank has a ledger and all the efficiency has been about improving the messaging back and forth between these ledgers. And then, you know, this is all going to be solved by this shared you know, private uh, blockchains, and so many of these have come and gone, it's kind of crazy to me. You have built successful applications, but uh, of the, of the 9,000 currencies, or, or 900 to 1,000 currencies out there, and various attempts of, you know, blockchain as a service, how, you know, what are the obstacles to kind of adoption, and where, um, yeah, where are the, where are the minefields, and wh how, are, how, Who's going to, basically, who's going to end up b with blood on the streets and who's going to end up uh, <laughs> going, go, you know, making it to the end? This, uh, I just open it up to anybody that... Uh, um, well, I, I mean, I can quickly address that. I mean, I think uh, there's, in all markets, there's this, you know, in all new, uh, you know, em emerging technologies, there's this hype that gets created and then, uh, you know, there's the Gartner hype cycle way of looking at it where it reaches this peak and then there's this trough of disillusionment and then it, you know, achieves, uh, you know, incredibly wide uh, adoption. Um, and, you know, I think that this space has been going through that. Um, you know, you can look at projects like Hyperledger, um, R3, um, you know, the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. Uh, they actually are about to announce tomorrow, so you hear it first, um, you know, a new standard for um, the, uh, the Ethereum, like sort of public-private enterprise solution so that um, there's a standard for having private chains and interacting with public chains. Um, and, uh, you know, and these all, thing, all these things really matter when it comes to uh, enterprise adoption. In I know, terms but why of, are some going to succeed and some failing? Like I think it'll ultimately, yeah, it'll ultimately come down to consensus mechanisms that, um, and as well as optimization of, um, you know, s transactions and transaction settlements. Uh, I, I, go ahead. I, I was going to say, I don't know who will succeed or fail, but I think we've got to be careful that it doesn't, uh, we don't make the same mistake that M-Pesa made, right? Which is M-Pesa got to people in poverty but people didn't get out of poverty, right? So like right now, a mother in Colombia, if she's a coffee farmer, she's borrowing at 40% on a dollar, right? Because there's so many intermediaries, right? So success for technologies like blockchain is to be able to reduce the cost of capital for that mother, right? So the people who win should be the people in that last mile uh, where banks and financial institutions will get disrupted because now you have a lower cost of KYC because the mother can prove her existence. I think well, the where 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 like as an example, banks are gonna like succeed or fail at this is just like why are you using it? Uh, I've been watching banks continually fail with these projects. Some of which gave us some really good technology, which you know is great. Uh, but like in 99% of cases, the uh, reason for using blockchain is not at all a reason for using blockchain. It's a reason to go back and fix code that has been really terrible for the last decade in almost every single case. Um, I have yet to see one example of someone actually do something interesting with it that was not simply a, we gotta get the garbage trucks in here and clean this thing up. Um, I think that will come in the future. I think it was a victim of hype and you know, it would not have been unreasonable for you in 2002 to think that no one would ever pull off e-commerce successfully because a lot of people had failed and I think we're starting to get into that trough with uh, enterprise usage here. In, public-private interaction, but there are still people doing really good work, um, and it's important to remember that this is still super early, and we should not expect uh, necessarily massive success stories until we've had enough time to figure out how this should actually work. I, I think these are basic 
organizational fundamentals that have always defined whether businesses or organizations succeed or not, right? Do you have a strong leadership team that knows what they're doing? Do you have product market fit, right? And I think there's a lot of companies and individuals and organizations using blockchain as a solution looking for a problem, right? As opposed to are you really truly solving a problem that exists and that is significant enough for somebody to exchange value, whether it's a cryptocurrency, whether it's actually money in both of our cases, that those, those are basic fundamentals that have never changed, right? I think the, the slight difference in this world is you get this ability to scale globally way faster than you ever could. Um, and so it, as we build our platform, we're not building it for the US, we're building it for the globe. Nobody's done that. There is no single voting platform that will work around the world. And we have to do that because we've got interested people literally around the world and so we have this unique opportunity to scale significantly faster, but we're solving a real problem with an experienced leadership team and all the other things that go into successful enterprises. It's just technology. But I would just say there are certain things that you, know, you couldn't do that you can do today. Like you know, in the city of Austin, if you've seen what we're doing, we're working with the people who are experiencing homelessness, who get bounced around multiple institutions and never have a contiguous record of their basic paperwork, right? And that's a good example where you're not gonna change the siloed systems, even the code is bad, I agree with you. Uh, I'm an old coder. Uh, but you know, blockchain allows the person who's experiencing homelessness now to say, hey, I exist, look me up, and don't treat me as a number. You couldn't do that with other systems. That's true. Yeah, I, I would just add that um, you know, in terms of widespread adoption, you just have to look at, you know, what does it do? What's the use case for it? And then you have to look at access. How do I, how do I obtain that token or coin? And then once I do, where do I use it? How do I use it? But finally, one of the biggest issues in the space is really storage. Where do I store those tokens and those, and those coins? And, you know, right now, everyone that owns it is wondering, well, hopefully it's secure. Hopefully, you know, no one's got my passwords. I mean, it's a, it's a real issue in terms of solving that back end piece and making that storage not only secure but easy to get to. Because you can make it really secure, it's just a little bit cumbersome to get to if it's on cold storage and, and the steps you have to go through. So I think ultimately we're gonna see technology and solutions probably even this year come out that will help solve that storage problem. And when that happens, you could see a, a, a big move, I think, in terms of adoption. But are the big players in this space right now in terms of the public blockchain, the Ethereum and the Bitcoin, is this a first mover advantage that uh, locks them in, or is it uh, going to be sort of the Netscape of the, uh, the blockchain world, and we're gonna see a 2.0 that's really going to be... Uh, there, there are third generation <laughs> blockchains that are currently uh, underway, and I think Ethereum is in the process of transitioning into a third generation blockchain, but there's also Cardano, EOS, um, and a number of other projects that um, really aim to solve some very big problems uh, in terms of having a public blockchain that can um, that can scale at the rate in which uh, you know in, in financial markets would require. So um, some examples of that are the consensus uh, mechanisms, right? So uh, you know proof of work requires all these computers around the world to be processing, um, and uh, in it, and because of the way that it's designed, um, it can actually bog down the network and slow down the network a considerable amount. Um, there's a lot of latency on a decentralized network no matter what, but there's uh, proof of stake, um, uh, delegated proof of stake, um, a number of different new, uh, new consensus mechanisms that could lead to, uh, to you know, near instantaneous transactions at a very large scale. And when you combine that together with um, things like sharding, um, you know, projects like plasma scalable autonomous smart contracts, and a number, you know, uh, already existing uh, state channels, and these are all technical terms, and you don't, you know, and I'm not going to be able to explain what they all are, but these are technologies that are currently being developed by a huge open source community, every day making progress, every day uh, moving faster than any single organization could ever move on its own, and uh, it's a really powerful phenomenon that's happening. Um, so, uh, so I, you know, I think I have a lot of uh, a belief that. These technologies are not going to slow down. They're only going to become better. And we could, in the next few years, see a public blockchain that has transactional capabilities at a you know, uh, Visa or MasterCard level uh, pretty. Which just um, is what? 7,000 transactions a second, right? I mean, this is a pretty, pretty big delta still between what Visa can process and what a blockchain can process. Yeah, but you know, the exponential acceleration of technology is real. So you know, 
I, I would, um, you know, I'd maintain that we don't really know what the future holds. And I think if we, I'm going to say something controversial here. If we want to be intellectually honest with ourselves, this could all go and just go away for something we don't see or we don't know is coming. Sure. The end, I mean, just who knows what happens. But e in terms EMP of, event. Like, what would that be? EMP event. I mean, <laughs> a all cosmic sorts of event. different things can happen. We just don't fat tell things. events that we don't see. Now, that's a very small, small, tiny percentage, but it's possible. Um, I maintain that you know, the future will be largely driven by the value that that creates. And I think you know, the algorithmic models for Hashgraph and these other companies that are out there, you know, even though that's a closed patented type system, I do think this, the open source stuff will be the winners at the end of the day just because of the social movement impact. But I, I don't know that it's going to be a blockchain because when you build a blockchain, you know, it takes time. You know, all the, you know, it's just a slower than a consensus mechanism through an algorithm. So, I mean, there's, there's technology out there that you know, is, is far exceeding what we see today. Oh, this is not the right forum to have this debate, but no, <laughs> not at all. Um, the notion of, of what a blockchain is is a state transition machine governed by some consensus mechanism that lives on a gradient from centralization to decentralization. Um, it's a huge argument that, peop that the smartest people in the space, that I have been having with the smartest people in the space for the last eight years, and one that will not get resolved. No one really knows what's happening. That's like the takeaway that you should take if you, if you just don't want to like go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> that being said, uh, I agree with both of them that there is some really interesting stuff getting worked on, most of which hasn't panned out yet, but some amount I think will, and I would have very little doubt that in the next decade we will get to you know, wherever it is we want to go with regard to the technical parts of this. That's actually my lowest, my you know, oh, smallest okay, but concern. But that's a kind of a cop-out Pollyannish answer. Where is the, where's the blood on the streets going to be getting from here to there? So Everywhere. I actually think that Bitcoin... I, I predicted last time that Ethereum will be 10x Bitcoin's market cap by, I think I said 2020, but I meant 2022. That being said, I think uh, Bitcoin actually has the most defensible value thesis because it's basically just immutability at this point. Um, you look at something like Ethereum, I have a lot of confidence in their leadership team. I don't know, I think they're moving pretty fast, trying to transition quickly. That being said, uh, I would put that as the realm of, you know, if you're trying to like do some technical due diligence on this stuff, uh, and, and you're really smart, maybe you'll be able to figure out what is actually going to work, and, and you know, we'll see. Because that's really, the at, at this point, to answer your original question, the only thing that I think has a first mover advantage is Bitcoin. It's basically just digital gold. It's immutable. It doesn't really need to change. Maybe some parts will get a bit better. Lightning will work out. You'll get a bit faster, cheaper transactions. We'll see. Uh, other than that, I think it totally, it's totally up in the air. What smart contract platform ends up winning um, I would currently bet on Ethereum just based on the fact that it actually exists, it has a community, it has network effects, and it has really smart people working on it, but totally up in the air. It might be something else. So I think, I think we have to remember, it, these are really early days. There is no broad-based mainstream use of blockchain today. And you can argue that Ethereum and Bitcoin are you know, highly scaled, <laughs> large enterprise systems you know, as networks, but it's not mainstream yet. Right? The average consumer cannot go set up an Ethereum wallet, fund that wallet, and transact with it. So these are really early days, and I think just like back in the internet days, I wasn't there clearly, um, Ashish was, but um, um, you know, a lot of innovation, I think what's happening now is that the pace of this innovation is way faster, and it's global. Um, internet clearly was a fairly US-centric type of innovation. Um, and so the pace is faster, it's more global, and lots and lots of stuff is coming out. And so okay. I, I think it's too early to, to bet. Um, I actually am going to bet that Ethereum will not be the winning platform okay. um, for lots of reasons. Um, but I, it's really, really early days. Okay. The only thing I'd say is try to think about hype versus reality, right? So there's a lot of hype around currency and value, right? And, and my message, or at least my plea to everybody would be, to think about the reality that people who are in the last mile face every day, right? So yep. you know, we went commercial, uh, started generating revenue 14 months ago, and none of the farmers that use our platform or the refugees have anything to do with currency, right? So it, I think the, I agree that it's probably not mainstream on the currency side, but I think technologies like blockchain when combined with IoT is mainstream when it comes to solving some basic problems around 
human struggles we face every day, right? Which is the fact that there's a lack of supply chain transference. You don't know where your genes came from, right? There is thousands and millions of people in slave laboring. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Panel, formal right. panel. <laughs> the, so, ga yeah, the gap, dude. The gap, the gap. yeah, right. But it's, I think it's, these are some of the tough issues that can be addressed commercially. Uh, and I'm not arguing against the currency side, but there's a value outside of currency. Okay, so let, me, let me build on that and on the immutability point because uh, you know, the, the blockchain does offer a number of different kind of inherent advantages to it. One, of course, is providence, right? And there's a kind of interesting examples around blood diamonds. It also offers a destination traceability. So if you want to only give money to, you know, saving the elephants, you can always know if your money is just going to. It, it solves a little bit for the fungibility of money. But baked into that is a, um, a question, I think, about a privacy, a right to be forgotten, uh, a lot of this Facebook uh, stuff has, uh, while it's you know, been around for a long time, people are really becoming much more aware, I think, uh, uh, of it now. And maybe I'll start here, uh, because you go, you're both involved in kind of identity in some way in your applications. Uh, how should we think about that? You know, one of these you know, stories that got a lot of uh, play a couple of months ago is, you know, what if you download the Bitcoin blockchain on your computer and somebody, you know, if you... Uh, uh, generations ago, a few blocks ago, had you know downloaded child porn. Do you now are you do you now have child porn on your computer? And how do you kind of think about that? And in particular, the privacy point. So I think the from a privacy standpoint, one of the things that's key is who owns the data, right? And and you know I use simple four words is that I always anchor back to the mother. If the mother can own, access, monetize, and permission her data, that's the real value of blockchain, Own, right? Own access, monetize. Own access, monetize, and permission, right? So she has the right to be completely dark, or she has the right to say, look me up, right? And that's how, um, at least I believe, you have to uh, address the privacy issue. Ours is a little tricky because um, in most jurisdictions, the public information for a registered voter is actually public information. Um, so the fact that you are affiliated with the party, what your address is, I can get that from pretty much any state in the country. Where it becomes tricky when you have the right to be forgotten is that stuff's permanent, right? And so if you decide you don't want to be a registered voter or you change your address, what do we do with that, right? Uh, because it's permanent, it's mutable. Um, and there's lots of similar use cases that frankly just need to be worked out that nobody has all the answers yet. We don't either. I think the important thing in regards to that is to really understand that you own your own private key. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, just like your password. But it's not a password to a central server that someone else controls. It's a password on the blockchain. So, uh, you know, privacy is sort of inherently enabled, um, you know, through the design, uh, you know, in the way that blockchains are, are created. Um, you know, that isn't necessarily always uh, true in some aspects. And, um, you know, and we could talk about those as well. Um, but, and, you know, certainly intelligence agencies and, uh, you know, if, if there's a bad actor, have the ability to uh, trace transactions. Um, and you can actually uh, trace transactions, you know, going all the way yeah. back to the beginning of the origins of the transaction, which is pretty interesting. But, um, but anyway. So my general pitch on this is I could totally see it happening, give it like 15 years. No one has, I could totally see... Uh, personal privacy, personal data ownership, provenance over your data, like integrated into some overarching system happening on a blockchain in like 15 years. That's m like my general timeline on a lot of this stuff where we have no idea how that would actually work in practice. Like, There's like a big brother scenario that you could... Sure. Well, yeah, you can imagine a lot, of, a lot of ways it could go poorly, but like actually designing that system is ludicrously difficult. Um, now, I think that it is a testament to how early it is that, uh, and I, I don't mean to call you out for this, but when you say like that's the real value here in blockchain, um, I think at this point like it's just not even worth ever saying that because we have no idea what stuff is actually going to work out and what won't, meaning that personal data provenance, uh, all of the nuances that go into privacy, differential privacy, if you want to be able to sell your data anonymously, how do you ensure that it is anonymized? Like all of these issues are really, really hard problems that will probably take a really long time to figure out in some principled, you know, like, like way that actually works and allows this to be usable for people generally. So I, I maintain, and in my experience as an investor in the space, that there is almost nothing out there right now 
uh, other than this ephemeral notion of value, currency, you know, come on, like, that, that you have to latch on to right now as a real, like, discussion to have, because nothing is launched. Nothing actually works yet. My pitch at the last summit was, this is the year that I think some stuff will launch on Ethereum, uh, and I still think that, but so far, only like two projects actually have. Um, and so while I agree that a lot of this stuff are, th that these are interesting verticals that we should certainly explore and that I enjoy thinking about, that it is just like insanely early to make any kind of statement about um, like this is where the value is or this is what's gonna work, it's, it's, it's completely unknowable at okay. this point. In, one in, the last two, no, in the last two minutes, um, I wanna go down the line, starting with you, Patrick, and uh, these people have, uh, you know, it's almost six o'clock and they paid a lot of money to be here. So I want you to tell them where they should put their money <laughs> if they want to invest in this space and play in this space. <laughs> it can be in broad terms, but I want you to make a, a, a call on it and I, I, I want the call to be uh, accurate as well, so. Uh, <laughs> No pressure, uh, <laughs> safe harbor, safe harbor, safe harbor. Um, <laughs> look, I, I think there's so much incredible material to read online, not all of it's quality, but if you do your digging, you can really educate yourself. If you find an interest in it, do your own research. Whatever money you put into the space, make sure that you can afford to lose all of it because you just never know what can happen. Um, I would just say research, research it really hard and figure out what you're interested in and why you think that particular protocol or application adds value to a community. I view it from a, from a community perspective. And we're not, you know, in the, in the modern world now, it's not about, you know, what country you're from or what gender you are. We're all just individuals on a global scale. So uh, I'm not going to give anyone any specific tips. I'm sorry. Oh, that was a really <laughs> disappointing answer. Okay. Can you... uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, MakerDAO, and Algor. All right. Yeah. Making a um, uh, you know, be an LP in Pantera, first one. No, I'm kidding. There you go. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, you know, I, so I'm, I'm not going to really tell you guys what to do. I can tell you what, what I've been doing. And what I've been doing is building a company um, that does an incredible amount of diligence and creates cryptocurrencies uh, for established companies. And I invest in those cryptocurrencies as well. In fact, Pantera invested in the last one that we did, and they're one of the two that you're talking about that actually already has a product on the market. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I'm not selling anything here, but what I'm doing is I'm investing uh, from my fund and through uh, for the capital that we have at CoinCircle um, into the cryptocurrencies that we build. Okay. Of course, invest in Votive, <laughs> yeah, either in our Series B or in our public sale later in the year. Um, you know, in all honesty, if you, if you go back to the Peter Lynch investing model, he'll always talk about investing in things that you understand and that you have passion for and that you believe in. And so if you believe in, in the space of making voting elections more transparent and verifiable, great. If not, invest in Ashish or <laughs> something that you believe in. Because um, right. if you do lose it, you didn't feel so bad because at least you were contributing towards something that you believed in. I'd say invest in supply chains, right? The world is a supply chain problem, and that's why there's two billion people who live under a dollar a day or two dollars a day. All right. Give a hand to my fantastic panel. Thank you very much.